this. There we go. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, let's uh, have a brief word of prayer here in our Bible study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your word which guides and directs us in all that we need for this life and all that we need to grow in our relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. And through Christ, we know that you have granted us eternal life that begins now and goes on forever in your presence. Open our minds and our hearts and our lives to all that you have for us today in Romans chapter three, that um, we might be encouraged and strengthened in our faith and better equipped to share your love with everyone in our lives. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. So the song we're going to sing is the Church's One Foundation, which is number 644. We have hymnals where we need them. Let's see if there's some level of... That is not pretty. Okay. Six forty four, yes. After I get this instrument into some level of that's still sorry. Sometimes it just doesn't want to play nice with me.
great, powerful song, is it not? So, as we continue in Romans chapter 3, um, we left off about verse 21. And let me find that. Okay. No, you're here. Ah, there it is. It's hiding. That's what I can't find. So we've kind of left the section here where um, Paul accurately describes sinful humanity. And at verse 21 here, we talked about this. We talked through this verse a little bit last week. Um, turns the corner into the grace of God. And again, in, in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for both the Jew and the Gentile. So after making that statement, he then goes on at great length to describe sinful humanity so that everyone realizes, wait a minute, that's me. You know, he just keeps piling it on until everybody kind of goes, okay, you got me. Um, and at this point, then he turns the corner and says, now that we all know that we are totally sinful and under God's wrath because of our sin, let me tell you what he has done about that. And so in chapter three, he begins that description of God's grace. In verse 21, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. So we have this righteousness apart from the law. You know, if, we're, if we look at the bottom of page 11, we kind of looked at that yesterday, or last week, the root word of righteousness is the same word as the word justify, which is God declaring us righteous or free. It's a legal action that God takes. And now if we flip to the top, top of page 14, this doesn't come through God's law. God's law is perfect. We are not. We come up against God's law and it crushes us. So apart from that, the gospel is this separate expression of God's love. And yet, the Old Testament bears witness to that. That Luke passage is from Jesus' walk to the road to Emmaus where he starts with Moses and all the prophets, that's another way of saying the whole Old Testament to explain himself to these two disciples walking along the road, demonstrating that as the Christ, as the Messiah, he had to die and rise again, which was completely outside of their set of expectations. It, it, it made no sense to them, especially to die on the cross. As cursed as anyone who hangs on the tree, right? And so ultimately, as Paul begins to make this case, then he goes on in verse 22. Um, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This is God's gift through faith. Now, we need to be careful here because we can get into this mindset that somehow faith is something I do. Not so. Um, faith is not seen as contributing to our salvation. 
faith, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, simply appropriates or grabs on to all the God, gifts God has given us in Christ Jesus. And the biggest gift there is salvation, which comes through forgiveness and new life. Recognize, you know, if we think about this, okay, um, let me think about it this way. Um, our friend uh, and seminarian Alex uh, Caldwell preached last Sunday, right? And the text was you had this woman who could not be healed. She spent all her money for 12 years and never got any healing, touches Jesus' robes, and she's healed. She says, your faith has saved you, you know, go in peace, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, she did something, right? And, and we can start getting confused about the fact that she did something. Not really. All right. The little girl was dead. What could she do? Jairus' daughter was dead. What could she do? Could she come to faith? Could she express faith? Could she have faith? No, she's dead. Until Jesus makes her alive. Now, could she respond to what the, the God who made her just did? <laughs> You betcha. <laughs> and especially as she's given the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. That is the nature of faith, right? Faith is a gift from God, first and foremost, always, every single 100% of the time, and our response is living out of that gift. We are made alive, and now we say, thank you for making me alive, <laughs> right? And ultimately, as Paul talks about this in here, we need to recognize that that's what's happening, right? So verse 22 kind of leads into verse 23, for there is no distinction. Now, if we go back to verse 11 of Romans chapter 2, we hear the words, for God does not show favoritism. So in many respects, this is kind of a, let me remind you, God has one set of standards. God has one way of salvation. That's it. There's no distinction. In verse 23, we get the summary of Romans 1.18 to Romans 3.20, right? Um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's a clear and unambiguous claim of the whole scriptures. There, there, unfortunately, are people running around who have so deluded themselves that they think, well, I'm just fine. I've, I'm, I have God's favor. I've done all these good things. Or now that I know Jesus and I have his grace, I don't sin anymore. That's an interesting one. <laughs> I've actually heard people tell me that. And we've had to have some conversation. And I don't know that they changed their minds. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Something's wrong with this picture. <laughs> right? It doesn't fit the scriptures. And curiously, because we look at ourselves through what the scriptures say, right? We recognize when we look inside, wait a minute, I don't match that standard, right? And the curiosity is this. This is one of the... the, the the little twists of how God does things. The fact that I recognize I'm a sinner puts me in a perfect place to receive his perfect righteousness and be relieved of it all. The minute I think I'm righteous, I'm judging myself inwardly as righteous, and now I'm sinful and sinned. That's how that works. It's just, it's, it's backwards. So, all have sinned, and then we have the beautiful word in verse 24, and. We often have to pay attention to those little words in Scripture. All of you are sinners, and the implication is deserving of God's judgment. And what follows, right, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This is a critical conjunction. 
the gift of justification is being made right with God. It's that redemption that comes through Jesus Christ alone. So we're going to pause here for a moment and move in a little different direction. We want to pass those out. There's a couple of biblical terms, and we'll run into them sooner or later in Romans. It is very, very useful to keep these things separate in our brains. Um, and it's also difficult to do sometimes. So let me try and get this up. So you'll see this says the distinction between justification and sanctification. Both of those words, justification and sanctification, are biblical words, not words we often use in everyday language. So let's take a look at them. In justification, we talked about this just a little bit under this righteousness that's been made known from God. It's the judicial act of God alone done outside the sinner, but in Christ. So if we try and understand that, I'm spiritually dead. And God from outside of me through Christ Jesus comes through the word and makes me alive. That's justification. Not only does he make me alive, but for the sake of Christ, he declares all of my sins that I will ever commit between conception and death have been paid for completely and totally by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And I have been given in its place Jesus' righteous life. When I look in the mirror, I don't always see that. I rarely see that, right? And we'll, we'll get to how that dynamic plays out. But recognize this is what God's word says. I don't stand on that I think I'm a pretty good person or that I'm a DCE or that I work for a church. I stand on Jesus died and rose for me, period, and declared me his dearly beloved child something God did outside of me that has nothing to do with anything that I have or can do. So if I get to be, you know, I know I'm old now, but if I get to be ancient, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful what, what I say in this group, right? If I start throwing stuff at me, um, you know, and I lose my faculties and I have no idea who I am, where I am or what I'm doing still in God's grace and salvation because he's done it because it doesn't have anything to do with me it has to do with him and his promise is his promise good yes right absolutely that's justification and recognize there's a variety of places in scripture where this is talked about um and we'll, we're not going to look up all these passages because it'll be way too long just on this piece. But it's to take this in is helpful. In Isaiah chapter 53, all right, it says, after the suffering of his soul, this is the suffering servant, this is talking about Jesus, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many. Isn't that curious? Long before Jesus ever arrives, we're told what he's going to do. And he will bear their iniquities. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Um, that Romans passage, you might know 5.8, um, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? And we'll run across that in, in due course. So this justification happens outside of me by God's power through Christ. Now let's flip to the right column. Sanctification. 
Now, when I was a kid in the catechism, it says sanctification is the process of becoming holy. And I read that. And as a kid, I was absolutely convinced, well, that means I got to do something. <laughs> I was completely wrong. They have modified that a little bit in the current catechism, which is a little more to my liking because it's too easy to misunderstand that statement. It's theologically correct, but does not communicate the correct theology. Does this make sense? Okay. Sanctification is God's work inside of me. Notice, it's still not my work. It's his work inside of me in which God works with the new man or the new person in a lifelong process of restoration. That sounds like a long time, right? You know, I read the other day that geneticists are now saying, hey, we can live to be 150. Wahoo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should I live to be 150, this process will still be going on inside of me. This does not end until we see Jesus face to face, either because he's come back or we've died and we've gone to see it, right? God is the same in each of these, but the process is different. One, that justification is a judicial declaration. You know, if you go to court and you're charged with a crime and you hear not guilty, how many times do you have to go back to court? Yes. Zero, okay? If you are learning how to do something well, how many times do you have to do that? <laughs> over and over and over and over and over and over, right? And even if you're good at it, you can always learn something more, right? Justification, single, single thing sanctification, day in, day out, minute in, minute out, month in, month out, year in, year out, over and over and over again, okay? And sometimes just like some things that we try to learn, we get it wrong more often than we get it right. See the difference? Now, if I am looking at my process of sanctification and think that's the state of my salvation, I could be in trouble, couldn't I? I have to stand on that justification. I have to look at that and say, wait a minute, God says this about me. And the faith response powered by the Holy Spirit is to believe it. Right? That faith action on that God has justified me and the Holy Spirit then gives me the power to say, thank you, Jesus. I'm going with it, you say, even though right now my life is a complete and total disaster and I'm doing everything wrong. Uh, and I know you love me anyway. Please help me. Please help. Or right now I'm living in a period of life where it's really hard. You know, I'm sad. I just, you know, I don't have much to give here, and I feel like I'm useless and worthless, you've told me that I have infinite value. I'm going to believe you instead of my own lion eyes, okay? Because often that's what the case is, right? The heart is deceitful above all things. <laughs> it can deceive us. So as we look at justification here, um, recognize that this is an instantaneous act of divine acquittal if you don't know Romans 8, 1, that is a really, really good verse to know. And again, eventually in this study, we'll get there. But that verse says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If my own heart condemns me, I have to take it to Romans 8, 1 and say, wait a minute. I know Jesus died for me and loves me and has saved me and made me his child. And this word says heart that you're wrong. If someone is coming after me and condemning me, I need to go to Romans 8, 1 and say, you can say that, but it's not your word that's going to stand. It's God's word that's going to stand. Got it? Because this is one of the places that Satan attacks us as Christians. He has a laundry list of every bad thought we've ever thought, of every bad thing we've ever done, and he will gladly remind us of all of that, which is half the truth, which is what? 
all lie. Half the truth is all lie. The whole truth is, yes, Satan, I did that, and Jesus died for me and forgave me and has given me new life in his place. That's the whole truth. So when Satan comes after me with something that I've legitimately done, I can go right back at him and say, but I've been forgiven in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and then I typically go on the offensive and pray for every Christian ministry I can think of and all the unsaved people that I can think of. Sooner or later, God begins to answer those prayers and Satan backs off. Right? So it is an instantaneous act of divine acquittal. Now, sanctification is this gradual process. How many of you like gradual processes? <laughs> How many of you like gradual processes that last decades? <laughs> okay. Most of us in our sinful nature, and especially in the culture we live in, want the microwave version. There isn't one. <laughs> All right. Doesn't exist. Catch the difference. I can stand on the fact that I have been redeemed and recognize that I am still very much in process because the sinful nature that lives in me will not fully leave me until I see Jesus face to face. And as long as that sinful nature lives in me, it's going to try to have its way. And that's the big battle in sanctification, right? And if I'm trying to control my own sinful nature, how well did that work out for Cain? Mm. Not so much. The way to control the sinful nature is to go to the foot of the cross. And say, Jesus, I need your help with this. Justification is equal. Totally equal before God. The Galatians passage, one of them talks about there's no male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile. We are all children of God there, period. But sanctification, on the other hand, is in degrees. Now, the way I often describe this is let's, now I know this is a big assumption for most of us, including me, because I've never been fast, even when I was young, but let's assume we're going to run a race, okay? And I get to start here, and Diana gets to start way back there. And, you know, Nancy, we're going to take you half a mile away. <laughs> um, you know, Sarah, we're going to put you, you know, a quarter mile up that way. But the finish line is the same. What do you think? <laughs> Got it? So part of this is as I see my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all starting the journey toward becoming more like Jesus at different places. So who do I compare myself to? Jesus and me. Where have I started? Where am I now? If the finish line is that way and I find myself back here, I'm going the wrong direction, right? And then I kind of go, okay, Jesus, I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> Help me out here. And ultimately, there's a passage in Corinthians that says each one should test his own life, right? So I'm not comparing myself to Kim and saying, oh, well, look how much further I am than she is, you know? Um, I'm, not, I'm not doing that because that's not how this thing works. I'm comparing myself to where was I a year ago? Where am I now? Or was I five years ago? Where am I now? Do I see in my life more and more of those Christ-like qualities? That's the question of this thing. In terms of justification, we're all baptized, beloved child of God, saved, going to heaven. In terms of sanctification, we are all at different places, which means I have to have compassion and mercy on fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Because some people who are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are a lot messier than other people. Yes? But I need to recognize it's in degrees. Sanct justification is complete. I don't have to add anything. There's nothing to be subtracted. When Jesus said in John 19, 30, it is finished, he meant it. 
The term he used was a business term, meaning paid in full. What was paid in full? The sins of the entire human race, from Adam and Eve to the last one born, paid in full. Jesus has paid for that. There is no debt of sin remaining, period. The difference is, do you know him as Lord and Savior or not? It is belief or unbelief that is the determining factor in going to heaven or hell. Right? And ultimately, it's complete. Now, in sanctification, it's growth. And the growth is often, if you read some of those passages, you know, you'll notice words like struggle and <laughs> things like that. And... <laughs> If you do this, then that, you know, you'll notice some conditional language. That's the language of growth, isn't it? And we can get stuck. All right. We pray the Lord continues to help us grow in this process. Justification is adoption. We have been made children of God. Um, I know that in the Lord's view, this is absolutely true. In many states in the United States of America, if you adopt a child, it is irrevocable. Do you realize that? I believe Indiana is one of those. I mean, literally, if you adopt this child, they can burn down your house, they can kill your dog, um, they can steal all your money, and you cannot disinherit them. You can on a natural child but not on an adoption, okay? That's the way the law works. Isn't that curious? God operates that way. In that gift of baptism, he says, I will be your father. That's the end of the sentence. Will he allow us to walk away from him and his grace? Sadly, yes, he will allow us that. Will he ever turn his back on us and say, no, I'm done with you? Never. Never. You want some biblical proof for that? Let's look at Judas. Does Jesus know Judas is going to betray him? No. Does Jesus know that before Judas dies, he is going to fail to repent and turn back to faith in Christ? I think so. Let me give you two events. The last two times Judas and Jesus have an encounter. First is in the upper room. And he reveals that someone is going to betray him. This, by the way, is an opportunity for Jews to repent. Recognize that, first of all. And they're all like, who, 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 who? And somebody asks Jesus, and he says, him to whom I give this piece of bread. And we miss this because we're not Jewish. The piece of bread is actually called the sop. It is in the center of the table. It belongs to the host exclusively. And if the host wants to honor someone at the meal, he breaks a piece of that unleavened bread off, dips it in the dish, and hands it to that person. He is honoring Judas with the highest sign of honor that can be, can be given in the Passover day. What does he do? He's loving Judas, even though Judas doesn't love him. Because he can't help himself. This is who he is. I'll give you a number two. Judas shows up in the garden. How does Jesus greet him? Friend. Recognize. Even though as God, he has perfect knowledge of the state of this man's soul. As God, he is continuing to reach out to him. He hasn't changed his orientation. Who's refused it? Judas. We have a God who claims us as his own. Why is infant baptism important? Well, there's one reason right there. Because it does bring that salvation. It does bring that grace. All right? And I'm not saying, well, if you're not baptized, you can't go to heaven. Not saying that. Scripture does not teach that. What I'm saying is here's one of the reasons it's important. But it's also important that parents get it. Right? It's not, well, I'm making grandma happy now. <laughs> no. Wrong answer. <laughs> you are doing your God-given duty as a parent to bring this child to Jesus. That's the right answer. And you know as a parent that your chief goal in life is to do whatever it is within your power to keep them connected to Jesus. 
And by the way, if you're a grandparent, you can do the same thing. Sometimes more effectively than mom and dad can do with some children. Right? Recognize. There's just something about grandma or grandpa, you know. I mean, I've already seen this with our grandchildren. You know, grandma says something to Evelyn that her parents have said to her 4,373 times. And she's like blowing it off. And she's a pretty good kid, by the way. But, you know, you have these issues. And grandma says it once. And, hey, grandma said it's... <laughs> you know, you see parents going, oh, good Lord. Uh, but there, you understand how that works. So we've got that ability. That adoption is part of justification. God declares himself to be my God. Matter of fact, Luther carried um, a, a little piece with him, had it in his pocket when he died. He said, I am just a beggar. But he also, again and again and again, in those darkest moments, recognizing that he was a beggar would say, I am baptized. I have been adopted by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Even though I'm a beggar, even though I'm just a beggar, I have been I am baptized. He has declared that I am his child, period. And he would say that to himself over and over and over until the depression started to lift. Do you think that that's why so often people think you have to be baptized to be saved sometimes that they misunderstood what luther was doing i think so i, I think part of it is the gift of grace that god grants to us where he promises you know god can be anywhere and god can do anything yes I mean, in a general sense, that's true. But there are certain places that God limits himself and says, I am going to be here and do this at this time, right? And so ultimately, that's where we're at. Um, in sanctification, it's a family lifestyle. Families always get along and love each other all the time, right? <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> So if we occasionally have conflicts in the church, which I know never happens, recognize this is part of our journey of sanctification. This is part of an, a, 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 you know, an opportunity to grow more Christ-like in the middle of that guy's an idiot and he doesn't know it, right? And then I got to look in the mirror and realize that this is the real idiot that doesn't know it, right? <laughs> That's how sanctification works. Justification is a gift. A gift by its very nature is undeserved, right? It's not something I've earned. Sanctification is a response. We've talked about that, right? Christian faith is always God acts and I respond. God acts and never the other way around. The world wants to say, I do something and then God responds to me. That's what worldly religion says. I do something good and then God likes me. No, I have news for you. God loves you, period. You could be spitting in his eye and he still loves you. How do I know that? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's a response. Justification is for us. It's that gift that is given for us. Um, he, Jesus accomplished it. Sanctification happens on the inside, right? It's on the inside of us, um, and it's messy. At least it is in my life. I don't know, maybe it's going splendidly in yours. <laughs> um, justification is total victory. It's absolute total victory. So in some sense, you know, Isaiah 43, it's soaring on wings like eagles, Right. Um, another one that I don't think is in this particular list, but, um, and maybe they've tucked it in. Yeah, they've tucked it in understanding, but it fits here too. In Ephesians chapter six, where it talks about the armor of God, it says, put on the full armor of God, then having done everything else you can, in the day of evil, you can stand. And when that evil comes to stand and the Greek word underneath that is the stand of a victor on a battlefield where total victory has been accomplished. That's justification. That's justification. 
So in many respects, that victory and that standing go together. Now, sanctification, on the other hand, is a battle. It is a war between the old Adam and our new Adam. And if there are Christians who don't think sin is serious, they're confused. They really are confused, right? So ultimately, it is a walking, wrestling, running, fighting, knowing that I am justified and my salvation rests here and recognizing that God is working within me for his good purposes and in his good way is sanctification. If I keep those two things separate, it keeps me from being discouraged when I'm in the middle of a battle and it seems I'm losing. Right? Is this stuff getting a little clearer for you? Because on this one, I can always stand. On justification, I can always stand. On sanctification, that's like a yo-yo sometimes, right? And recognize that it's God, all of it is God's work. When we are discouraged, we need to go back and revisit justification. We need to go back to those passages and we need to read them and hear them and tell each other about them when we're discouraged so that we recognize this is what Jesus Christ has done for me. When we're complacent, we need to hear about sanctification. Got it? Make sense? Didn't know all that was packed into Romans 3, and maybe it wasn't. I just sort of stuck it in there because it made sense to go right there. So <laughs> at any rate, um, hopefully this little piece of paper, when I ran across this years ago, I said, thank you, Jesus, because it helped me sorted out in my head in my heart and i have since whenever i have the opportunity shared it with fellow christians to say look let's keep these two things straight in a lot of the christian holiness traditions where now that i'm saved in jesus i gotta live a holy life they're mixing these two and that leads to some real heartache for people because if my life isn't holy and i know my life isn't holy i can't even show that at church because everybody expects me to be holy. So now I've got to hide behind a mask and, and, and my faith is withering as a result, right? Of course, we have our version of this, right? Do you know what the unofficial Lutheran liturgy is? It's not just Lutheran, but it definitely is practiced here. Well, how are you doing today? Well, I'm fine. Well, how are you? I'm fine. We need to kill that liturgy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we just really need to kill that liturgy, all right? You know, how are you doing today? Well, I, you know, sometimes I'll say I'm doing okay. You know, when I'm when I'm feeling a little bit, uh, you know, clearer in my head about it, you know, Jesus is still Lord, I'm a mess, but it's all right. Um, you know, to recognize, hey, this is, we're living in this battle. And if we're fine, we're probably confused at that moment, right? Because the battle is always ongoing. And the longer we walk with Jesus, this is what I've discovered in my life. And I've heard it from other people as well. And I've read it in some of the writings of other people. The longer one walks with Jesus, the more we see our own sinfulness, right? And the, that's when we need to focus on justification. It doesn't matter. We're saved. And we're seeing our own sinfulness because the Holy Spirit is ready to take us the next step along the journey of sanctification. Got the dynamic, how it works? Okay. Anybody else ready for heaven? It's like, get me out of this mess. <laughs> right. Now, here's the deal. Yes, heaven is coming. And if we're still breathing, the Father has a reason that we're still breathing. Okay. So we go, okay, Father, thank you. Give me the grace. Keep walking this journey until I see you face to face. Yes? Mm -hmm. So we will leave it at that today. Um, you know, lots of stuff to think about here. And let me go back here to this. And that means we'll pick it up, what, about verse... 25-ish. Now, here's the other thing. Um, next week, um, you get to uh, play with or, you know, 
torture or whatever, uh, Pastor Wigley. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. I'm at a conference during this time. We're not going to do Romans. I told him, don't worry about Romans because it's, you know, we won't do all that fuss and bother. So he will come in with something. All right. But you can come in with something too, right? Mm -hmm. If you have questions, now's a good time. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, put the theologian on the spot. Yeah. Um, and then we will continue Romans chapter 3, let's see, 8 on the 15th. So, can you believe we're already in July? It's unbelievable. I need June again, but I'm not going to get it. So, there it is. Next year, you will. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I just need the 30 days now. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's the way life rolls sometimes, right? So, good to be here. Shall we pray? Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. So time. you are welcome. Um, yes, I will. I'm looking forward to being able to see some family and especially my mom.